Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, the one Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha was serving them, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of perfume, pure and expensive nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped his feet with her hair. So the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was about to betray him, said, Why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of the money bag and would steal part of what was put in it. Jesus answered, Leave her alone. She has kept it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Then a large crowd of the Jews learned that he was there. They came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, the one, who, the one he had raised from the dead. When the chief priests had decided, but the chief priests had decided to kill Lazarus also, because he was the reason many of the Jews were deserting them and believing in Jesus. May God bless the preaching of his word. Well, Father, it is with great joy that we come under not just the singing of songs and the prayers of the saints and the testimony of your Son through the lives of those saints, but as we come now to your word, we pray that there would be your presence that comes upon our hearts and souls, our minds, and even our eyes to see Christ in John chapter 12. May the magnitude of who he is impact us and change us forever. And may we see the gospel on the pages of this text. We pray this for your sake and your holy name. Amen. Jesus Christ is a wellspring of life, but who knows how deep this well is. This soul of ours has love and cannot but love some fair one, and oh, what a fair one is Christ. What an only one, what an excellent one is he. Put the beauty of 10,000 worlds like the Garden of Eden into just one place. Put all the trees and flowers and smells and colors and tastes and joys into that one location. Oh, what a fair and excellent thing that would be. And yet, it would be far less than that dearest, well-beloved Christ. Far less than one drop of rain to all the seas, rivers, lakes, and oceans of 10,000 worlds combined. Oh, pity forevermore that there should be such a one as Christ, so boundless, so bottomless, so incomparable in excellence, glory, and sweetness, and yet so few take him. Those words were written by a Puritan pastor in 1637. The name was Samuel Rutherford. Rutherford was writing to a dear friend who he was trying to win over to the, to the loveliness and the excellency and the beauty of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Not only do these words mark the heart of a pastor who was enraptured with the person of Jesus, but these words mark the tone and the tenor that we find here in John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verses 1 to 11 This is about the extravagance of Christ, the beauty, the loveliness, the value, his charm. Many have said John 12 is a transitional passage that marks the end of Jesus' public ministry and the start of his private ministry. Uh, We get to chapter 13 uh, in the the following chapter, and and that begins the upper room discourse with with Christ and his uh, disciples. Others have said that Uh, This is the the last six or so days of his 
ministry, his life before he goes to the cross to be crucified, dead, buried, uh, and raised. So half of the Gospel of John uh, from chapter 13 onwards, or even here in chapter 12, six days before the Passover, John tells us, he's in Bethany. So almost half of the book is dedicated, or over half of the book is dedicated to this last week, in fact, the last few days of Jesus' life. But what marks John 12 more than any other feature in John's gospel is the, the triumphant language, the kingly image that is painted of Jesus throughout. So in verses 1 to 11, we have Mary anointing the feet of Jesus as the anointed king. Uh, he's seen in 12 to 26, he's received by the Jews as the triumphant king. In 27 to 36, we see the father affirming him as the crucified king. His hour had come to be glorified. And then finally, there's the prophecies that Isaiah sees of him as the heavenly king. So he's the anointed king, he's the triumphant king, he's the crucified king, and he's the heavenly king. All four images are pictured in John chapter 12. And in each and every one of these scenes, we see an aspect of Christ for us to behold, for us to worship, for us to love and adore in all of his grandeur and splendor. And so this morning, as we come to the scene of Mary anointing the feet of Jesus, the main thing I want us to see is this, a life that is poured out in selfless devotion to Christ, that is a life that can never be wasted. I almost thought to put the main point as the Jim Elliot quote, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep, to gain what he cannot lose. That's going to be here in this text as well, but I thought I'd just put my own words there. Life that is poured out in selfless devotion is a life that can never be wasted. Two scenes we see here in John chapter 12, extravagant devotion and evasive deception. So let's begin with point one, extravagant devotion, where John writes, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, the one Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha was serving them, and Lazarus was one of the ones reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of perfume, pure and expensive nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped his feet with her hair. So the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Along with this triumphal language we find in this chapter, John 12 is, is like many chapters in John, it's a, a compare and contrast chapter. Uh, we've seen several times in John's gospel that Jesus causes division wherever he goes. There are some who are coming to Jesus, they're believing in Jesus, uh, they're trusting and following Jesus because of the truth. And then there are others who hear the same message but they're rejecting Jesus, they're denying Jesus, they're hating Jesus because of that same message and same truth. The hard truth always divides believers and unbelievers. The hard truth always divides believers and unbelievers. And really in John's gospel, we've seen this belief and this unbelief kind of on a, on a mass scale in numbers, in groups. There's groups who are believing in him. There's groups who are denying him. Now we come to John 12 and we see this belief and this unbelief, not so much in large scale numbers, but now we see this belief and unbelief literally personified with two living, breathing human beings. Mary, who's anointing the feet of Jesus, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrays Jesus. So we have two different pictures of belief and unbelief. But the other compare and contrast here is between the start of John 12 and the start of John 11. If you remember back in John 11, that the emphasis uh, was on Jesus' love for this family. Jesus loved Martha. Jesus loved Mary. Jesus loved Lazarus. But now in John 12, this, this love, this emphasis of this relationship, it's now switched to their love for Christ. Martha, verse 2, is serving him by cooking food in the kitchen. Here we see the practical side of her devotion to Christ. We see the practical side of worship through the act of hospitality. Hospitality is an act of worship. It's an act, it's a spiritual gift God really does give to certain people. 
And Martha certainly has joy in preparing these meals for Christ. Lazarus, verse 2, is enjoying fellowship with Jesus. Uh, he's eating and he's drinking with his, his Lord. This, I think, shows the, the communal side of worship. He's worshiping through eating and drinking. And then, and then there's Mary. And Mary, I think, her, her devotion is extravagance. She shows the extravagance of her worship as she recognizes the value and the excellency of who he is. There's several clues in the text that indicate Mary's worship and devotion. Firstly, we can call Mary's worship here a courageous worship or a courageous devotion. It's courageous because at the end of John 11, we read these words, verse 57, the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where Jesus was, he should report it to them so that they could arrest him and put him on trial. So ever since John 11, which uh, probably was a few weeks before this scene in John 12, maybe a few weeks have passed since that decree, but the decree is still there. there. The Jews have been drumming up this hostility toward Jesus Christ. For this family to be hosting and welcoming in a known fugitive in the confines of their home, that's, that's a dangerous thing for them to do. This is dangerous worship. This is dangerous hospitality. In fact, it's so dangerous that in verse 10 of our text, we read that the chief priests had decided not just to want to kill Lazarus, uh, Jesus, but now they're wanting to kill Lazarus as well, because he was the reason many of the Jews were deserting them and believing in Jesus. And so clearly these men, these Jews and Pharisees, they would not have been happy for this family to host a man like Jesus Christ. These devoted disciples are putting their own lives ahead of their own safety. Having Christ is far more significant to them than their own personal lives. Devotion to Jesus is worth more in this world than anything we could obtain, even life itself. Friends, I wonder if you would have been so brave and courageous like these guys. I wonder if your faith is authentic here this morning that you you'd be willing to risk even your own life just to be in the presence of your Lord and your King. These disciples counted the cost of knowing Christ as greater than their own personal safety. This is courageous worship. The second thing I want to note here is this is not just courageous, but it's very costly. This is a costly devotion. We see there in verse 3, Mary takes a pound of perfume and he says it's pure and expensive nard and she anoints the feet of Jesus. Most, most people believe, most commentators say that uh, this was a, a spice that was called spike nard that you would put in expensive perfume. It was sourced from the northern parts of India in the Himalayan mountains. Probably a family heirloom Maybe something this family had inherited. Maybe they were just a rich family and they had it on, you know, stored up or whatever. But uh, I think this would have been maybe a gift, a dowry for one of maybe Mary's future weddings. Maybe she had a rich uncle. Maybe their parents had died. We're not too sure, but Jesus says that she's been storing it up since the day of my burial. Since the day she'd, she'd gotten this gift... She'd been saving it for a very, very special occasion. John notes this was about a pound of oil, roughly 11 fluid ounces or 325 mils. Think of a can of soft drink, but oil. That's a lot of oil to be pouring out on one person, on one individual, who's not even going to be alive for very much longer. Now, maybe Mary knew this, maybe she didn't. Jesus did say he, she's storing it up for the day of my burial. Maybe she knew that that was coming soon. But the point here is that the hesitation's not on the part of Mary. She doesn't hesitate to use this expensive ointment. The hesitation is on Judas. It's on the part of Judas, who's not happy with the costliness of this oil. Verse 5, he says, Why wasn't this sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? So one denarii is one day's wage. You times it by 300, that's 300 days wages. 
uh, minus Sabbath days, minus holy days when they couldn't work. We're looking at about a year's salary. Let's put a round number on it, $50,000 of money. $50,000 a year's wage for someone in these days on one person who was not going to be alive for very much longer. Maybe don't think of it in terms of money. Maybe think of it in terms of possessions. Maybe you own something here this morning. Maybe it's a car, a job. Maybe it's your family, your wife, your children. What possession do you currently own that is so valuable that you would struggle to give it up for the sake of Christ? Would you be willing to lose your husband, your children, your brother, your sister, your father or your mother for the sake of gaining Jesus Christ? Do you like Paul in Philippians 3 when he is met with the beauty and the loveliness of knowing Christ Jesus count all of this world's goods as rubbish in comparison to him? That knowing Christ is worth far more than anything else or anyone else combined because we know the one who has gone to the cross to purchase us. Here we see Mary in the right response to the sight of Jesus Christ. Seeing him pulls from the depths of God's people desires for what amounts to costly devotion, costly worship. What are you willing to give up for the sake of having Jesus Christ? The third thing we see here is that this was not just costly, but it was humble devotion. I couldn't think of a third C, so I just went with humble. So verse 3, Mary takes a pound of perfume, pure and expensive nard, and notice, Mary anoints the feet of Jesus, and she wipes his feet with her hair. She anoints the feet and she wipes the feet with her hair. Now, we are told in the other gospel accounts that uh, Mary didn't just anoint the feet of Jesus, but she did anoint the head as well in this scene. Uh, Matthew 26 makes mention of this. Now, when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came and anointed his head as he reclined at the table. Now, again, this is not to be confused with the account in Luke 7 with the woman of the city, the prostitute who comes into the house when there's a party and uh, she cries and she anoints uh, the, the, the feet of Jesus as well and wipes uh, his feet with her hair. That's a different account. But the one in Matthew is this account in John 12. So Matthew and Mark make mention that Mary anoints his head. John only makes mention of the feet. It's very interesting. Now, it could be that... Uh, Jesus, in the very next chapter, chapter 13, anoints, uh, sorry, wipes or washes the feet of, of his disciples uh, in the cleansing and the washing of the feet is a great act of humility. Uh, we don't know exactly why John only mentions the feet, but the point is Jewish people hated feet. Maybe you consider yourself a Jewish person who hates feet as well, because there is such a thing as a foot fetish that people have in this world, and it's weird. (laughs) People have foot fetishes where they're attracted to people's feet, and that's a really weird fetish, okay? Not the Jewish people. Did not like feet at all. In the ancient world, feet were the lowest part of a human's uh, body. Not even slaves in these days were required to anoint or wash the feet of a guest in the home of their master. This was below even for a slave to do. So that's the first sign that this is very humble of Mary. But the second thing is that she doesn't just wipe his feet. She anoints them with her hair. She wipes his feet with her hair. Now, now that's a pretty weird thing for Mary to do. There's no way to make this normal. There's no way to say, well, what does it say in the Greek? It's weird. (laughs) That's what it says in the Greek. Mary's weird and she wipes his feet. She's breaking all kinds of societal norms by these standards. Even by our standards, this is just plain weird. 
But remember, a woman's hair in the ancient world was considered her glory. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, the woman's hair is her glory. And so for a woman to let down her hair, I mean, this was grounds for divorce if she was married. To a woman to let down her hair in public, she would only let down her hair in the most intimate of spaces or on her wedding night, in her bedroom, those kinds of things. So this is very scandalous, very risky for Mary to do here. But it's also very humble. We have Jesus' feet, the lowest part of his body. She's anointing his, his feet with her hair. Mary, in essence, is saying to Christ, your feet alone are worth my entire devotion. My entire inheritance is worth just the feet of Jesus. Mary understood the preciousness, the trustworthiness, and the magnitude of the person and work of Christ. I like what John MacArthur says about the love of Christ. He says, The soul that loves Christ cannot help but believe in him, and the soul that believes in him cannot help but love him. See, love for Jesus and faith in Jesus are so inextricably connected to our Christian lives because the soul that sees the, the, the preciousness of Jesus cannot help but be compelled toward such a lovely one as he. Love for Jesus Christ is one of the most surest signs that the gospel has won the heart of a human being. Thomas Vincent, a Puritan pastor, I mean, the Puritans wrote extensively on, on just one verse of the Bible, right? They make books out of those things. It's, it's quite astonishing. He wrote a treatise on just uh, one or two verses in the book of First Peter. And he says something profound in this book. At the start of this book, he says this, the life of Christianity consists very much in our love unto Christ. Without love to Christ, we are as much without spiritual life as a carcass when the soul is fled from it is without natural life. Faith without love to Christ is a dead faith and a Christian without love to Christ is a dead Christian. Dead in sins and in trespasses. Without love to Christ, we may have the name of Christians, but we are holy without the nature. We may have the form of godliness, but we are holy without the power. Give me thine heart is the language of God to all the children of men, Proverbs 23, 26. And give me thy love is the language of Christ to all of his disciples. Friends, that is the scene that we find painted with Mary and her extravagant, costly, courageous, and humble devotion, she saw Christ as lovely. What we find in this moment is a soul that is so fixed on the beauty of Jesus that she was willing to give that which she could not keep to gain what she could not lose. She saw the precious pearl and she buried it in that field and she purchased it with everything she had to obtain Jesus Christ. Someone once said years ago, let me hear you sing, let me hear you pray, and I will write your theology. If Jesus Christ, the very word of God, were sitting in this service here this morning, friends, if he could listen to your singing, if he could hear your prayers, if he could look into your heart, what would he see? Would he see a soul that is sold out, poured out in devotion to Jesus Christ? Or would he find a heart that is deceived and deceptively wicked, like the other side of the passage that we find here in point two? We not only see an extravagant worship, we see an evasive deception. Evasive deception in the heart of Judas. Have a look at verse four. After Mary anoints the feet of Jesus, the house is filled with the aroma of Christ. One of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was about to betray him, he said, why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? 
And John, John gives us a commentary on this. Now, he didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And he was in charge of the money bags and would steal part of what was put into it. Jesus answered, leave her alone. She has kept it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. And so in this text, we find another scent, another aroma that is wafting through the pages of Scripture. But this time, it's not a pleasing aroma. It's a putrid smell. It's a dishonest odor. It's an ungodly odor that is wafting in the heart of Judas Iscariot. The very same time Mary's pouring out her heart, Judas is seeking to betray him with his. Gospel of Matthew says it's only just after this scene in John 12, Mary anoints his feet. He's going to leave this house. Now, John doesn't record this, but Matthew does. He leaves here and he goes to the Sanhedrin and he betrays Christ for 30 pieces of silver. Think about that. He's already stealing money from the money bags, John says. And he still does not have enough, so he has to go out and betray him for 30 pieces of silver. This is how deceptive hearts can get in sin. This is how uh, greedy people can get for money and gain and possessions. The deception that Judas has to, to work with Jesus for three years, to see the, the signs he performed, to listen to the Sermon on the Mount and the, the, the wonderful things he would say about the kingdom of God, to see a man raised from the dead in John 11 and yet still seek to betray his Lord and King for 30 pieces of silver. I mean, by this point in John's gospel, we should not be surprised at this. We shouldn't be surprised at how deceptive sin makes the human heart. This is a real picture of unbelief right here. And I have no doubt that Judas honestly believed he was being noble in front of the disciples. This is what false piety, false, false um, religiosity does. We can sometimes, even as Christians, get into this pattern of justifying our sin and trying to justify why we're doing a particular sin or maybe we make ourselves out to be the victim. And uh, surely I'm not the only one who does this, where we can, we can justify it to the point where we actually start to believe the lies that our sin is telling us. Now, pure speculation, I think that's where Judas is at this moment. I reckon he's so deceived that maybe even he thought he was going to give money to the poor. Maybe he really did. John doesn't seem to think so. John tells us, verse 7, he didn't say this, sorry, verse 6, because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. So Jesus rebukes him in verse 7. And then in verse 8, he says, you always have the poor with you, but you don't always have me. Now, People have taken that to say Jesus didn't care about the poor or the outsider. I think that's not true. I think there's a few things we can learn from these verses. Firstly, Jesus says that the poor will always exist. That's the first thing we take from verse 8. The poor will always be with us. Maybe he's thinking of Deuteronomy 15, 11. There will never cease to be poor people in the land that I am commanding you. Open your hand willingly. Give to your brother in need in Deuteronomy the Bible tells us that the existence of poverty is not a sign that a culture has done something wrong. A culture that has poverty in it is not a sign that that culture is in sin. Jesus says the poor will always be amongst us. There will always be societies where some people will have more and other people will have less. This is a design feature. It's not a bug. And that doesn't mean that we ignore the poor or don't help the poor but the concerns of this world's issues and problems should not displace the higher priority of the church in worshiping Christ. The church should be about humanitarian aid and, and helping others. But if those things displace the worship of Christ and displace the preaching of the gospel, then the church is in serious error and sin. The second thing we learn here is that trying to 
uh, make people feel guilty about the existence of poverty. We, we know people like this. There's worldviews that do this. They leverage guilt of society to leverage money to unequally distribute this wealth to those who are less fortunate. This is a worldview called Marxism, and it's totally opposed to the gospel, the, the worldview itself. It hates God, and there are plenty of reasons why Christians should give to the poor. There's plenty of reasons. Guilt is not a reason. Christians give out of gratitude to the poor, not out of guilt. Gratitude to what God has done. Sorry, not to the poor, but to what God has done. Not from the thief's leveraged tactics. Trying to make people feel guilty about the existence of poverty is the thief's primary tactic in distributing wealth and giving it to the poor. The third thing we learn here is to never underestimate the deceptiveness of greed when it comes to the love of money. Never underestimate how deceptive the love of money and wealth and material possessions can be in the heart of even Christians. 1 Timothy 6.10, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and it is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs, says Paul. Now, I have no doubt Paul writing that probably had in mind Judas here when he betrays Christ for 30 pieces of silver. There are countless texts throughout the New Testament that speak of the dangers of money when it is mixed with the love of wealth and far too many professing believers have wandered away because the things of this world, the pride of life, John calls them, has snatched them away from Jesus Christ. All that to say, friends, we must guard our hearts against sin and greed and idolatry of money. So John finishes now in verses 9 to 11 with the plot to kill Lazarus because, again, Lazarus is associating himself with Jesus. Verse 9, then a large crowd of the Jews learned that he was there. So they came not only because Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, the one he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests had decided to kill Lazarus also because he was the reason many of the Jews were deserting them and they were believing in Jesus. That's a wonderful thing that we read there. The fact that many of the Jews were starting to believe in Jesus because of what Jesus had done for Lazarus. This is a a testimony to the power of Christ to Lazarus. No doubt Lazarus does speak to the Jews of his day about what Christ had done for him. Maybe he he spoke about what it was like to come back from the grave. I mean, maybe God completely wiped his mind. Who knows? But once again, we have John not recording any words of Lazarus. We only have the result of the event of Lazarus and the fruit that that caused. One commentator says it like this. He says, what was it about Lazarus that compelled these Jews to believe? The answer is not in what Lazarus done for Jesus, but in what Jesus had done for him. Paul Lazarus, he was raised from the dead. He didn't do anything to these Jews. And now because of something Christ had done to him, they're wanting to put him to death. It's, this guy can't catch a break, honestly. It's a poor disciple. Friends, they wanted to put him to death because of the testimony that Christ was, or Lazarus was, to these Jews. And the same should be said of each and every one of us. If we were dead in our trespasses and sins, think about this, if we were dead in the grave of idolatry and worship of self and lust and pride and evil idolatry, and if over us a voice has cried, Christian, come forth from the grave, then are we not a spectacle for those to see the work of Christ in us? Should not the world marvel at the fact that we have been changed, we have been transformed by the beauty of the cross and the compelling loveliness of Jesus? Not because of anything we've done, but because of everything he's done for us. J.C. Ryle says they could not deny the fact of his having been raised from the dead. Lazarus was a witness to the truth of Christ's lordship, whom they could not possibly answer or put to silence. Friends, I wonder if that could be said about your faith here this morning. 
I wonder if your faith and your love and your devotion to Jesus is so compelling, such a threat to the unbelief of people in your life that you start to get persecuted. People start to hate you because of how you testify to Christ. People start to persecute you and possibly one day even put you to death. Lazarus is a testimony to the grace and the glory found in the boundless beauty of the person and work of Christ in the gospel. Friends, this is why Christianity is not just a bunch of rules for us to follow. This is why it's not a formula for us to just transact with God. We trust in him, we get forgiveness of sins, and then we can just go on. Christianity at its very center is here in John 12 with this fragrant devotion and worship and pouring out our hearts to the loveliness of Christ. Worship of God, worship of Jesus, worship of all that he's done for us. And until you turn from self and sin and trust solely in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are not going to see Jesus as compelling or lovely because you see Christianity as simply a bunch of commands to follow. Anton de Saint, ex you, Berry. I learned French from the internet, by the way. (laughs) That's a name of a person. He wrote a book called The Wisdom of the Sands. He wrote a few books, actually, but The Wisdom of the Sands is a book where he says this this quote that was so wonderful. And here it is. He says, If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. What does that mean? Well, applied in a Christian context here in John 12, I think it means this, that when when you call people to come to Jesus Christ, when you call people to worship the one true and living God, the one who gives them life from the dead, the, the sovereign God, the one who sent his son to be the sacrifice for your sins and rise three days later, you aren't calling them simply to a list of rules to follow. You are calling them for a longing for worship, a longing for the person and work of Jesus Christ, an abandonment of self and a centering on everything Jesus is and says to us on the pages of Scripture. You are longing for that which is deeper and far more satisfying than anything this world can give because we know the the person, the trustworthiness of Jesus and the cost he's paid to purchase us. Teaching people to long for the sea is the the idea is telling people to be compelled by the glory of the one who gave it. It is not mere commands, but it's infinite worth and beauty that compels worshipers of Christ to pick up their cross and to follow him, no matter the cost. There's something else in this text that I want to finish with here today. And it's seen in this idea of Mary pouring out this expensive, extravagant oil onto the object who is Christ. If we were in that room with those disciples, we would have joined in and piped up and probably gotten quite upset at Mary, I think. I think that's fair to say. If Mary were to simply be pouring out this oil on a cat a dog, you know, a dead carcass. Think of something just utterly stupid. Fair enough. She's bizarre. She's ludicrous. She should be locked up for wasting that that oil. But Mary is not seen as insane. She's actually seen as sane in the eyes of God. And you can only be viewed as sane in this passage if you pour this oil out on something of far greater value. And that's what we see here. And that's what she does. Something that is worth more than a meager $50,000, friends. She pours this oil onto something who is God incarnate, the most precious person and object in this world, taken on human flesh, 
And in the gospel, we find this lamb of God, this sinless, perfected lamb of God who comes and he dies and he is crucified on the cross where God pours his wrath out upon the Son of God. And when he hangs on that tree, Jesus takes an eternal weight of sin and the eternal weight of wrath, but he does it in a few short hours. How can he do that? How can he take eternity and turn it into a mere matter of hours and satisfy eternity in a few hours? The the answer is because of the, the preciousness and the nature of who Christ is. He is far greater and far more valuable than the sins of all of the people of 10 billion worlds combined of sinners in one location because his blood is far more precious than all the sins combined. And in fact, Jesus says Mary anoints him for the day of his burial. Jesus understood this oil was not being wasted. Do you? That's the question, friends. Do you understand? Do you comprehend the magnitude and the extravagance of the greater object that was being anointed in Bethany that day? Do you understand that as you have life and breath given to you by God, you are being called to the endless immensity of Christ? The endless immensity of the Son of God who gave his life as a ransom for many and was resurrected and ascended to his throne as king and Lord of all. Is Jesus Christ worth more to you than even your own life? Because if so, then you can rest knowing a life that is lived and poured out in devotion to Christ that is never, ever wasted by God's standards. In God's eyes, You are completely sane. In fact, you are commanded to do that. But in the world's eyes, in the eyes of Judas, you will be criticized. You will be called out. But we know the one who is far more valuable than even our most valued possessions. As Rutherford so wonderfully says, Oh, pity, pity those that there should be such an excellent one as he so boundless, so bottomless, so incomparable in excellence, and yet so few take him. Our Lord and our God, we pray and we thank you for your extravagant grace. We thank you for Mary and the picture that is painted that she was willing to give this oil that she could not keep. She could not take it with her when she dies in order to gain something far more valuable, far more trustworthy than this world's goods. Though our heart and our flesh may fail, you are the strength and our portion, our inheritance forevermore. Oh Lord, let that not just be the testimony of our lips, may that be the cry of our hearts. May we, like Mary, sit at the feet of Jesus Day by day, as we pour our hearts out over the scriptures, over prayer, over communion and fellowship with saints and with our family and with our children, and may they see a heart that is reflected like Mary's here, that we would be willing to count the cost of giving everything we have to follow, to follow you. Please help us, Lord, to live a life in selfless devotion and not deceptive evasion. We ask this for the precious name of Christ, our King. Amen.